Well, hello, everybody. Let's see, am I on? Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, you can. Good. Okay. My daughter's in here somewhere. I don't know where, but I'm going to find her in a minute. Okay. Uh, well, it is really good to be here with you all. I love this place. I'm going to jump right in to what it is that I'm going to talk about today and tell you exactly where we're going. We're talking about the role of the imagination in the Christian life. And for this chapel, what I want to talk about is, is kind of a layer under that, is the role of the imagination in reading Scripture. Uh, it's important that we read Scripture with our imaginations engaged. It's vital that we do this. Because if we don't, if we don't come to Scripture with engaged imaginations, we are going to miss a lot of what's in there. But if we do read with our imaginations engaged and we see through our mind's eye, there is so much to be found on the page of scripture. Why is this? It's because scripture tells a story and stories require imagination. In fact, it's one of the ways that we hide scripture in the heart is by way of the imagination, is by imagining the prodigal son, is by imagining the good Samaritan, is by imagining Jesus hanging on the cross. We imagine these things in our mind. Story is, it's a Trojan horse for truth. You can slip a lot past the gates of our defenses when you tell a story. It leaves us in a place where we're receptive and not feeling like we're just being lectured at, right? And so we welcome stories because we like to imagine. There are three main points that I want to walk through in this so that you know where we're going. The first is I'm going to talk about how we are by nature imaginative beings. The second is we're going to talk about how the Bible is an imaginative book. And I don't mean by that that it's fictional or that it's just made up, but it is imaginative. And we're going to talk about that in the third part where we're going to practice what we've discussed by reading a short passage imaginatively focusing on a detail to hide scripture in our hearts. And my wager is this, that the little two verses that we're going to look at, you won't ever see the same after today. So, a number of years ago, I realized to my great shame that my then 13-year-old son had never seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. Never seen it. And as soon as I realized, I know, thank you, you guys got my back. Um, as soon as I realized that, we hopped in the car and we drove to Target to buy what was then referred to as a Blu-ray disc. And we got home and on the drive home, he's sitting in the seat next to me and he says, hey, I have a question. And I said, what's that? And he says, does Indiana Jones manage to get away from the big rolling boulder? And I just gave him this sideways look like, what do you know about any giant rolling boulder? You haven't seen the movie. Why, why are you even asking me this question? And he said, well, because in the um, Lego Raiders of the Lost Ark video game. <laughs> feel, I, I feel like we really connected just now. In the Raiders of the Lost Ark video game, he gets chased by a giant boulder and it breaks him into all these little pieces. Now, I ask you, what would a responsible parenting look like in that moment, right? My son was interested in knowing more about what happened than how it happened, and that was not okay with me. Uh, he is his father's son, however, in that respect, because I have ruined many great movies uh, by allowing my ac myself access to spoilers and peeking at trailers and reading articles. And you've done the same, right? We've, we've done this. But we talked about his question for a little bit and we came away with a sort of a Ramsey family motto. And Noel Ramsey knows exactly what I'm about to say right now. And this was the motto we came up with. Let the storyteller tell the story in the way they want to tell it. Let the storyteller tell the story in the way they want to tell it. I'm happy to report that I have heard my son say this to his sisters. He is a good boy. 
Why does it matter whether or not I tell him what happens on the ride home from Target? I mean, it's information that he's gonna get eventually at some point anyway, so what is the big deal? The big deal is this. Mere information is not the point, right? How the information is delivered, how the story is told, is every bit as important as the information that we gather along the way, isn't it? Why is this? It's because as human beings, we're not just collecting information to live. We are experiencing the sequence of events. We're having our sight go from darkness to light. We're investing emotionally in the heroes of the story. We're using our imaginations, and by doing so, we're gathering so much more than just the sum total of the bits of data that you get in the story. And God made us this way. That's how we're made. As people made in the image of our creator, we are by nature, by definition, creative beings. We're like him in that, right? We have an eye for detail. We're not mere collectors of data, nor are we mere appliers of lessons. We're people who collect stories, and we collect stories that we can replay at any time. If I said to one of you, tell us the story of your first kiss, you could do it if you've had a first kiss. And to a degree, all the rest of us hearing that story would be able to imagine that with you, right? If we don't come to scripture with our imaginations fully engaged, there's so much we'll miss. But if we do read, Through the mind's eye, there's so much we stand to gain. So I wanna set the stage for doing this with scripture and then we're gonna look at that example. The Bible is an imaginative book. Scripture tells a fantastic tale. It's a true tale, but it's a fantastic one. It's a fantastic tale, it's an origin story. It's a quest, it's a procedural, It's a redemption song, it's a comedy, it's a tragedy, it's a homecoming, right? It's all of those things. And engaging our imaginations with scripture, trying to imagine the scenes as we read them in our minds, not only helps us hide scripture in our hearts, but it helps us cultivate a more informed understanding of God and of ourselves. And scripture, I'm happy to report, is meant to work that way. I mean, think about what the Bible is. The vast majority of scripture is either narrative or poetry, right? Most of your Bible is story or poetry. It's text that is filled with imagery and sequence and detail and real world analogies. In fact, storytelling was Jesus' primary method of teaching. He was a parables guy. He taught in parables most of the time. Rather than saying, because A is true, you must do B, he says, there was a woman who lost a coin, right? We're meant to learn this way. Here's something that I want you to chew on. This is something I'm gonna give you and I want you to just kind of put in your mind and think about and test it and tell me if I'm not right. Tell me if this isn't true. This is something that a professor of mine once observed when I was in seminary. And what he said is this. He said, every bit of information that we have about the afterlife, every bit in scripture of information that we have about the afterlife every bit of information that we have in scripture about the spiritual realm, every bit that we have in scripture about the nature of God himself is to some degree in the pages of scripture anthropomorphized. That's a big word, but what that word means, you know the word, but what it means is it's converted into language that human beings can understand. 
that's, that relates to the human experience. So everything we know about the afterlife, the spiritual realm, and God himself is in some measure anthropomorphized. Let me unpack that because this means that scripture is engaging our imaginations. Everything we know about what lies beyond this world must be explained in ways that we can understand through our lens of our world if we're going to comprehend it, right? Otherwise, it would be like trying to explain color to a blind person, right? If the spiritual world isn't anchored in an analogy to this world, how can we grasp it? We'd have no categories for it, right? Because we only know what we know, and that's it. We don't know what we don't know. So in the Bible, we have imagery of the afterlife, streets paved with gold, trains of robes filling a temple, the horsemen of the apocalypse. We have a celestial city, right? You can imagine those things, why? Because they have an analogy in the world that we inhabit. Why does it matter? Are these things real? Yeah, they're real. I believe they're real. But they're real in ways that I think are beyond what we can understand. Right? Still, I can imagine them. And because they're anchored in analogies, I can imagine them in ways that make sense to me as somebody who is an earthbound creature, which is what all of us are. I mean, think about how God describes himself in Scripture. He describes himself as a king, as a shepherd, as a father, as a warrior, as a still small voice, right? All of these have some analogy in our world that helps us understand what lies beyond our world. And they invite us then to imagine. He's a great king, but he's greater than any king I can imagine. He's a perfect father, but I don't even know what it really means to have a perfect father, but he is one. A still small voice, a warrior. Whether we realize it or not, we can't read scripture without using our imaginations as a crucial necessity for understanding. It's a crucial necessity that we read scripture with engaged imaginations. Because this is true, one of the best things we can do when we come to scripture is come with our imaginations engaged. We must seek to flesh out the words that we're reading, to imagine the scenes that are being described, to consider the implications of the details that are provided there for us. Scripture calls for this kind of reading. Let me offer two reasons why Scripture calls for this kind of reading. The first is that Scripture is written in thrift, meaning it is a very sparsely written book. Scripture was written during a time when there were, there were no FedEx Kinkos where you could go and buy reams of paper and go on as many rabbit trails as you wanted. So there's a certain efficiency to the writing of Scripture that intends for us to use our minds and our imaginations to seek to understand what's also not on the page, to fill in the gaps. But another reason why scripture calls for this kind of reading is because we are human beings and scripture is describing the human experience. So scripture is telling us our story. So we're not adding to scripture by allowing our imaginations to fill out what isn't on the page. That's not the issue here. In fact, I would say we are obligated to read with our imaginations if we want to understand what is on the page. We're obligated to do this within, within of course, the reasonable confines of what we understand about the human experience and what the text of scripture allows. But you'll read in the New Testament about a man whose daughter died. And it will not give us two or three paragraphs about his grief. But if we don't imagine his grief, we will not really understand the question he's asking Jesus when he asks him for help. We won't understand his pain. We won't be able to relate to it. 
But the information is given, his daughter dies. We're supposed to, as human beings, say, that's a big deal, and that's terrible. We're meant to read scripture as human beings, not as mere data collectors. We're meant to immerse ourselves in the story of scripture, and scripture is mostly story. It's often where truth comes to life for us, right? We do so much of our learning through story. Later this afternoon, I hope you can all come, I'm gonna tell you a story about the only painting Vincent Van Gogh sold while he was alive, he sold one. And I'm gonna tell you the sad and beautiful story about that. And you're gonna learn a lot, but I'm not gonna say, here's the applications we should all draw from this. I won't do that once but it's a compelling story. Eugene Peterson wrote this, he said, story is the most adequate way we have of accounting for our lives, for noticing the obscure details that turn out to be pivotal, for appreciating the subtle accents of color and form and scent that give texture to our actions and our feelings, giving coherence to our meetings and our relationships in family and in work finding our precise place in our neighborhood and in our history, end quote. See, story engages the whole person with complicated, nuanced truth rather than simple life applications. And this is the key for any growing disciple when it comes to understanding scripture is that story has power in itself. So, Let's look at an example of this. Not every story in the Bible is a parable, right? Parables are stories that are made up to, tell, to make a point, right? But much of what we know about God in scripture actually took place and it's not told in parable, it's just told this happened, right? And so it means eyes have seen and ears have heard and yet we're still called to imagine what was seen and what was heard. And the details in these stories, how things really happened, they shed light on things. They shed light on the nature of God. They shed light on the life to come. And such details are exciting and they're vivid and they're often right there on the page and we can skip right over them, but they're just right there. And so I wanna look at one that is from the Easter story and I want us to use our imaginations to explore the implication of what we're reading. If you have a phone or a Bible with you, it's gonna be Matthew 28, verses two and three. So just two verses. It's the verses about the rolling away of the stone from the mouth of the tomb where Jesus was buried. So you're all aware this happened, right? That Jesus rose from the dead. This is something they teach here at Covenant. Um, so it's early Easter morning. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, I love how scripture says Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, um, you know, are going to attend to Jesus' corpse, but they're concerned on their way over there, they're concerned about how they're going to get inside because a stone is covering the mouth of the tomb and it's too heavy for either of them to move or for, for, the, or for the two of them to move together. And then this is what we read in Matthew 28, verses two and three. Engage your imagination. Behold, there was a great earthquake. For, because, an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. There's some flourish in there, right? There's some description, some things that we say, that had to have been a wild moment to encounter. Now anybody who knows this story knows the angel rolled away the stone, that the women didn't do it, the angel did. But what these verses do, thanks to grammar, is they reveal, uh, they shed a little light on how the angel rolled away the stone. But first let me ask the question, how do you assume that the angel rolled away the stone? Do you see him, you know, like Grogu, moving the stone with his hand? That's Baby Yoda, 
for the uneducated. <laughs> do you see him doing that, just moving the stone with his hand? Or, or do you see like a bulked up gym rat who is pushing the stone back and he's struggling, but he's not struggling too much, but he's kind of struggling so that you know that it's hard to do. Is that what's happening in your mind? See, what Matthew does is he joins two things together in this passage. He joins the movement of the stone to an earthquake. There was an earthquake. Why? Well, the language says there was an earthquake because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. I love personally the little detail that the angel rolled back the stone and sat on it. There's like just this beautiful kind of triumphant arms folded, <laughs> how do you like me now, kind of moment. I really think, I think that's awesome. It's so triumphant. But what, the angel, but what does the angel moving the stone have to do with the earthquake? What are those, why are those two things both in here? What, what do they have to do with each other? I mean, the stone wasn't so big that when it moved, the earth shook. And the reason we know that is because normal people put it in place. So it wasn't like the stone was so big that it caused an earthquake when they moved it. So what is the connection between the stone being moved and the earthquake? Matthew's language implies that the earthquake was the means by which the angel moved the stone. I mean, that's astonishing. That's astonishing. Because here you have these women who are worried that the stone would be too heavy to move. What they have on their hands is an insurmountable struggle that they cannot understand how it can be overcome. Guess what you and I have in our lives? Insurmountable struggles that we don't really know how they can be overcome. To a struggle like that, the angel doesn't move the stone. He moves the earth beneath it. And that's how he rolls away the stone by shaking the earth itself like shaking a pebble off of a rug. Imagine it. Are you imagining it? You're imagining it. What does that tell you about God? As Western people, we approach scripture as consumers of information, right? For the purpose of instruction in ethic and morality. Tell me what I'm supposed to do, how I'm supposed to be, what's good, what's bad. And so we ask of a text, what's the lesson? What's the application that I'm meant to draw here? As though some lesson is the highest aim of reading the text. That is the same as saying, all that matters is whether Indiana Jones escaped the boulder and how he escaped the boulder is irrelevant. Who would say that? It's not irrelevant. Details matter. They're beautiful. They set the temperature in the room. They import the drama. They lay out context with story and imagery. We get implication. We get subtlety. We get emotional cues. We get active participation. We get lyric and music when it comes to truth. And we miss so much if we see the unfolding story as little more than a vehicle to get from one lesson to another. Wondrous details are all over the pages of scripture. They're like Easter eggs. They're just there. They're all over the place. And they're beautiful. And they're there for us to find if we would only look for them. Did you know that when Jesus and his disciples left the upper room to go to the Garden of Gethsemane for Jesus to await his arrest, in two of the Gospels, the cue for that transition says, when they had sung a hymn, they departed and went to the Mount of Olives. 
our imagination should be engaged in the, in the idea, the notion of Jesus standing from his seat and singing then. Because this was when he gathered his disciples, he washed their feet, he told them that he was going to die, he prayed his high priestly prayer, he fed them the Lord's Supper, he told Judas to go do what it is that he was going to do, his disciples said they would never betray him and he told them all of you are going to fall away. All of these things happened in that upper room and when he left that room, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane to await his arrest. And before they left the room, he sang about the steadfast love of the Lord never ceasing and his mercies, never coming to an end. What does that tell you about the strength of Jesus? Wondrous details are all over. If we just look for them, they're there. And I'm not talking about cryptic codes to decipher. And I'm not talking about predictions of the future or any nonsense like that. I'm talking about what's on the page. I'm saying that scripture is filled with details we may miss our whole lives if the only thing that we're after is the lesson or the application. A lifetime of reading scripture will reward the person who spends their lifetime reading scripture. So here's what I'm asking you today. When you come to scripture, let the storyteller tell the story in the way they want to tell it. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the richness of your word. I thank you for the way that scripture is written such that it rewards a lifetime of reading. Uh, Lord, would you give us a curiosity Would you ignite our imaginations when we open the pages of scripture? And would you give us a longing and a desire to know you more deeply through the way that you have unfolded who you are to us in the pages of scripture that you've given us? Would you make us to be people who want to hear the story of our salvation, the meaning of our existence in the way that you want to tell it, which you give to us in your word? Father, I pray for this, the rest of this conference that we have together that you would use story powerfully in all of our lives. Um, thank you for the beauty of, of art uh, and the way you have designed us to reflect your character by creating. Uh, by the way, the musicians over to my right have been creating an experience for us in the music that they play and, and sing and the way that the uh, luthier put that guitar that fell over a minute ago together. And uh, Father, you have surrounded us with, with examples of your majesty and your greatness. And so Lord, give us receptive hearts to receive from you and engage our imaginations. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.